Alright, welcome to It's Not Really About the Crafting. This is episode number nine. Every game needs a good swamp. Uh, Umber, I hope there won't be any issues with the stream as well. Uh, but everything is looking tip top so far. Knock on wood and all that stuff. So on this stream, it's not really about the crafting. We do a lot of crafting, but it's not necessarily for the crafting's sake. It's for all of the other reasons, gameplay and such. And in this case, I have a game that is making its way to not necessarily uh, a swampy place. Um, it's not not swampy, but it's really more it's really more of a uh, of a desolate wasteland. Hey, Darkness, what's up? Thanks for checking out the stream. So I made all of these uh, some time ago. Let me let me grab one that's easy to easy to reckon with. <laughs> Umber, uh, yeah, I should just call these snow, and then I then I'm done. Hey, Noel. So these were these were put together uh, quite a while ago, um, and they're okay. Uh, it's a little bit it's a little bit flimsy and fragile, but the basic idea was I really wanted to have scatter terrain for a swamp or some sort of wasteland setting. In this case, probably more swamp than wasteland. So I used this like, um, let's see. What's one that I can easily flip over without? This one's this one's pretty solid. I'll use this as a reference. So this is all pretty much glued down. Uh, and so these are um, whatever it is, cardboard or, or uh, yeah, basically cardboard bases. Some of these are more of a pla there's like a plastic, a thin plastic that I used, hoping that wouldn't warp. And really, warping happened, but not to any extreme degree that I really care about now. And the goal was just to create pieces that could be put onto a game board, you know, to create the atmosphere of a, a sunken city or an old swamp, kind of a, what's the never ending story, that kind of a swamp setting. And so when I built these, um, I just cut out random shapes and then I used, uh, this is sculpt mold which is not, not the hardest, toughest material. Like some of it flakes off of here because it's been just kind of sitting and it's not really protected or, or painted up or anything like that. And then I just took basically material that I had and stuck it in or glued it in place. So some of these kind of like uh, tufts, they're just like cheap, cheap plastic foliage that I had sitting around. Uh, I said, okay, that looks like, that could, that could be convincing overgrowth. Um, this is like a, looks like a statue, uh, either print or just sort of scatter miniature. There's actually like a, like a rock maybe from like a fish tank in here. And then obviously these are like kind of cut to look like fence. Um, and so the, the, all of these are some version of that. Um, just kind of whatever I had, you can see here, there's like this kind of old kind of a uh, tree. It actually has like a a figure sort of molding out of it on the back, which could be lots of different things. You know, barrels and just sort of odds and ends. I actually even dismantled. And this one here, you can see part of a boat that I made once. Part of it's here, and the other part of it's sunk in over here. So I clearly at some point decided to upgrade. Obviously I have a bunch of pieces that aren't yet connected. Just kind of whatever I could throw on that could kind of sell a, a, a lost a lost world type of idea, sunken into the swamp. Um, so what I, and then the plan was always to basically prime it, paint it, uh, get it to a good state, and then all of these sort of recessed areas, I would do some sort of resin pour um, to, to basically really sell the, the wet look. So there's a number of steps left. Um, it's actually in a pretty exciting place because I think a lot of these can be sort of finished um, uh, in not too much time. Uh, but that's basically what we've got here. I've got a lot of pieces to work with. Um, let's see. 
uh, darkness, some of the village ruins in Breath of the Wild, absolutely. Uh, these were actually made before Breath of the Wild came out. They've been sitting around for years, I think. Uh, maybe maybe not quite before, but around that time is, is what it feels like. Uh, Noel, thoughts on Sculpta Mold? I use foam clay and was wondering about the difference between the two. I've only really worked with Sculpta Mold and Das Clay, and um, they're just good for different things, right? I think Sculpta Mold... Um, I've used on this, and I can pull them out sometime, but I have a bunch of uh, sort of terrain kind of boards that I've made, like desert and water, and I've used Sculpta Mold for those, actually, just for the desert boards. So I think for that, it ends up kind of just naturally looking just about right. I don't think I did a very good job molding a lot of these necessarily, but it won't really matter. Excuse me, it won't really matter given what they're going to end up being. But easy to work with. If I can work with it, then... It's definitely easy to work with. I've never used foam clay before, so I'm curious. I'd have to try that out. Cat, uh, uh, congrats on the on the mini. That's cool. Uh, Thanos, how long have I been using terrain uh, for my campaigns? Um, uh, probably four years. Yeah, for the first year that I ran, I pretty much just uh, I drew very elaborate dry erase uh, maps. And I wish I had not done them draw race. I wish I just had big short, big rolls, big sheets of paper saved from those. But uh, mischief, I made these. So these are these were made uh, some time ago. They've been sitting in a couple of plastic tubs, just being all sad. So this is just cardboard. Some of these are plastic. Sculpt them all. A bunch of junk thrown on there, and uh, and here we are. Uh, darkness. How the mimics go? Great. Yes, seven years. Seven years is extreme darkness. That's why I was like, ah, it hasn't been seven years, but it's definitely, definitely since before Tears of the Kingdom. Um, I just don't, I just don't remember having Zelda Breath of the Wild as inspiration for these, and I, I feel like I would have because that game meant so much to me. But it couldn't have been that long ago. Um, it's just been a few years that they've been sitting here because I haven't been making terrain more than four or five years. So. I could go about this a couple different ways, and I'm tempted. Um, because I've been staring at these in this state for so long, and not really, because I put them in a tub and I put them away, because I don't I don't like having a bunch of unfinished stuff on my shelves, even though I have plenty of unfinished stuff on my shelves. I'm kind of tempted to take one of these almost as far as I can to like completion, or at least much, much further to the point of completion just to kind of see what they can be or I can kind of go bit by bit and sort of and sort of you know glue and, and get everything just in place so I'm I'm torn I'm torn on what to do Breath of the Wild six years ago that's probably true um, How about we take stock first? I don't even know how many of these pieces I've actually finished gluing. Uh, this one, this one is effectively ready for uh, sealing. I'll probably just do like a uh, uh, what do you call it? Do a Mod Podge coat uh, just to kind of get everything. I might have to do some specific priming in certain places, but honestly, most of the painting is going to be uh, you know two or three tones probably only. Like I don't want to do a lot of crazy crazy painting so let's say so that one's ready let's put that one there this one felt pretty solid too uh cat hey ryan what paints do you use for these uh for terrain i use the cheapest acrylic paints that i can find so um you know craft smart apple barrel like the stuff if you go to michael's and you go all the way to the back and it's like a you know 80 cents per little bottle, that's the kind of stuff to use on terrain, in my opinion. Oop, this one's loose. Uh, but I actually think this guy's cool, so this one's neat. <laughs> it's got an overturned table, has sort of a Bioshock feel to it. We've got a barrel. This looks like an old weapons rack and like a gargoyle, and then the tree. So this one, this one's also ready for the next phase. Let's see how many of these pieces I have. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff on this one. Ooh, this guy, this guy. This one's a nice, nice big uh, one. So this is fun. So one of the things that I really liked about uh, the process of building these, and obviously this was long before I was doing anything on stream, 
uh, but there's like storytelling, right? So I had like, uh, you know, this is some somebody face down in the in the mud here uh, next to like looks like a chest of drawers or at least a, a workbench or something. And there's a bench over here, another gargoyle, this kind of stump. I think I was just kind of throwing whatever I had at these things that I didn't have any immediate plans to use. But you know, that guy could be a lot of different things. It could you know, it could actually be a body, or it could be somebody that's been, you know, found by the party, or it could just be like a set of clothes or like something that they find discarded. So that's kind of cool. This one's ready too. That's great. That's three pieces. Not to say that any of these would take long to begin to finish. Um, this one's actually got a lot. I think this this may this may motivate me to to finish them all first. Uh, Breath of the Wild's a great source of, of inspiration for sure. All right, so I can tell. So I, I kept these around, I think, with this set, but I think you guys can probably agree. I don't think that this type of tree really fits. I'm not sure. I'm not opposed to having other trees, but I think if I did, I would use my other tree terrain to kind of mix in. I don't think I want to make the decision that these, and I don't even think I could salvage these like it would be more trouble than it's worth probably trying to get leaves and stuff off of it to try to make it look you know whatever so let's see how much of this is attached yeah okay so this is another one so this is like a um you can get these big big uh chunks of bark from i think i got this on amazon at some point um it's a yeah just a nice big cover this is interesting these are like spikes coming out just just a, a hazard even for me uh, and then the boat and then the growth so this one's also probably fine I mean I could add more to it but I don't have to all right so that is four pieces that are in a pretty good state let's see this guy these are all Secure. There's like a bench. This one's a, this is an empty coffin. So again, more storytelling. I like that. This is a stuck boat, but this one otherwise is kind of plain for the amount of room that it takes up. I can definitely see adding some more pieces to that. So this one stays over here. Uh, Stormwind Arc Dungeon. Oh yeah, that was that was a fun one. That was a fun dungeon uh, from Tears of the Kingdom. That was neat. I mean, and it's seriously, any dungeon that's that vertical too is um, can be tricky to do. So here we just got a couple of couple of crates. Um, this one definitely could use some more some more activity. This one I think is completely plain. This one doesn't have anything at all. Just sort of a just sort of a pit. That one needs decoration. All right. So these guys I don't like. I don't think. So I'm gonna set those over there gather all this what else we got uh, darkness I do not know the crawling up I, I don't that, that doesn't that doesn't jog my memory I'm not sure um, uh, Noel your stream made me look at all the unpainted terrain I have right now too so I'm trying to paint under dark terrain thoughts on color scheme purples, blues, um, using black to, to transition at the edges of that, but generally speaking, like pink, purple, uh, dark blue, light blue, just just wet blend all of that, and that'll look pretty under dark to me. I kind of like that like neon, neon under dark look. Um, that's one take. You could also go um, look up uh, um, uh, my, my mind also goes, maybe this is more like Shadowfell or like Dark Realm, but um, uh, almost something that's more kind of stark, like grays and blacks. You could do that too. It depends on what the vibe of your Underdark is, I think. Hey, Dungeon Chronics. Uh, fuse Mechanic. Um, it's a good question. Fuse Mechanic sounds like a, would that just be like a uh, a different take on an Artificer maybe? Sounds cool, darkness. Uh, so we got, looks like an old ladder here. There's a chair, looks like a pile 
a pile of like rusty swords maybe table and a rock but definitely some foliage this one's a good example of like there's some spots that I need to touch up with glue where I can kind of feel the the thing I used as the bottom here kind of give peeling away a little bit from the sculptor mold so I have to care for that uh, only a few more pieces I did make a lot of these this is <laughs> I have a tendency to make a lot when I make stuff so this tree probably doesn't fit Get rid of that. What else do we have here? We have these. They're almost like tropical plants, but I, I think I think that they'll end up looking about right. All right, so we've got a nice bench sticking way up. We got some more iron fencing and a chair. Okay, so that needs to. So this can use some foliage. All right, some really big, crazy trees here. Don't want to use those. And these aren't glued down. Okay. So we can see what work we have here. So this is a statue, uh, a horse, and a dude with no arms, and a sword that's actually visible sticking out. I like. I like. It's fun that I'm like reviewing my ideas from years ago. I don't even know what this is. It's like a broken. Some kind of broken ironwork, like a gate maybe, like a portcullis that's been shattered. So this could be, could be a sunken stronghold or something like that. Ooh, Thanatos, how to go about making a ship? Do you mean like a ship, like a like a full-on ship? Because <laughs> uh, you could make one that is just sort of the levels of the ship, or you could go about making a full ship, which is uh, super badass. Level by level, that's all you can do, right? Little little by little. Um, I've been wanting to make a new boat for a while, a new proper ship, so that will likely be on the stream at some point, but not quite yet. So there's another weapons rack and a bunch of barrels, so this is more like a supply thing, and there's definitely some separation there. Um, but this could use some stuff as well. Okay, so we've got... A full, yeah, a full ship. Um, uh, so one way you could do it, and um, I've actually, my 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 big ship is is begun uh, over here. Um, use paper and figure out the shape that you want the ship to be. So how big? So you know, kind of make a paper template, tape pieces of paper together, and cut them, and make sure that like if you put a grid on it, and if you put your minis on it, like it's the right size. And then if you take that um, shape, whatever that, whatever you end up with, whatever you're comfortable with, let's say that's your like top layer of the ship, um, pick your material. So let's say half inch foam uh, or something like that and lay it on and basically draw that and cut out that exact shape. Um, I don't know, depending how big you want the ship to be, say five or six times, could go even nine or 10 times. And using that, you can almost like a cake carve away, carve the, the shapes. You'd have to sort of glue the pieces and maybe cut out the inner parts of those levels, but you could basically use that then to kind of shape the ship and then you can do paneling and stuff around it. That's my plan for my ship is to sort of, I have I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I did, I did 10 layers um, and it is, it's a decent size. Um, so once, <laughs> once we get to that project, uh, you can see how that goes, but that's just my big idea for doing it because I'm not sure, like there's probably cleverer ways to do it, but when I look at a ship, I go, hey, that's kind of a big cake, right? Uh, mischief, which piece of terrain is easy, most useful? Um, I would say um, most useful. I mean, the most used stuff is probably the smaller scatter type terrain. So like a well or a fountain. Um, I did a video about that. Uh, Black Magic Craft has a great fountain build that just uses like, uh, you know, thin white sheets of foam. It's super, super approachable. Um, 
I definitely like having little houses. Um, even just a couple of little kind of townhouses can can do a lot to fill out a scene. Um, it kind of depends where you are and what kind of game you're running, right? Because every different every different setting or biome is gonna sort of demand something different. Um, I think we're gonna go in order of size. Uh, good, good call, Noel. Uh, dungeon tiles. I took the longest to even make my own, um, mostly because I found somebody on Facebook Marketplace like four years ago that was offloading like their whole Dwarven Forge set, um, and so I, I used that for a long time. And uh, I, I still believe it or not, I still haven't made like a classic, just like gray set of dungeon tiles. I still haven't done it yet. So that. Uh, may get that experience on stream at some point too. So let me get these semi ordered by size and out of the way here. And we'll start, start in on them. I think I like the idea of getting all of this attached. Attached and decorated. And then I also have some, some gluing to do. my very high-tech strategy for these sections where I find the, uh, the the base peeling away from the sculptor mold is I mean definitely glue but I think probably type of glue is very important and I think where is my proper white glue? I think someone has run off with it. One moment. Let me grab my, yep, let me grab my glue. Uh, Umber, I wanted to make a sand location where the players have to jump on objects and not touch the sand or else they alarm. Uh, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, tremors, right? Giant worm. Uh, or some other type of worm. You could also do uh, onk eggs. Onk eggs would work well for that. I have not.
There's a lot of peeling. I can always add a little bit of hot glue, but most of this is actually sitting pretty well. Um, it just needs a little bit of help staying together. I've never, I, I've never owned any HeroScape tiles or board game pieces. Um, um, I do have the tiles from Mansions of Madness. Um, and I bet there are also other games that have sort of like cardboard tiles. Also, like, if you get crafty, you can probably find and sort of print and paste and sort of make your own um, tile sets that way. I've never tried that before, but I think that would work. All right. Let's see here. is going to be a lot of seeing where things can fit. Need to grab Uh, Thanatos, I organize my notes uh, sequentially by date. So when I'm planning a session, I put all my notes for that session together. I print off my notes for a game uh, four up on a sheet of paper, so four, four pages on one page, so I'm not flipping around a bunch. And any notes that I take during the session typically goes right onto that, that set of pages, however many I have. And then I three-hole punch it and throw it in one of my binders. If I need to remember something later, I just need to remember, generally speaking, what session something happened in. And then I can find it. guy a little hole to sink into if I can. Uh, Noel, absolutely, those are easy. They're really easy paints all around. Now ideally a lot of the stuff, if I were doing it again, you know, having all of the materials ready and basically letting the drying sculpt the mold hold everything in place is certainly ideal. But, you know, that's not always where we find ourselves. Uh, Chronics, yes, actually, I mean, kind of loosely, like if in this case with this stuff, if I don't get it done, it's not the end of the world. Um, that's kind of my approach to crafting as a whole anymore because um, sometimes it gets done sometimes it doesn't but I don't want the game to wait for my crafts but if I do have some of this stuff done in say a week or two uh, it will absolutely be used in a game that I have that is heading to the wasteland in this case it's the wasteland of a, uh, a city that is no longer it's a city in my world called Haven that was effectively swallowed up by a Cthulhu monster uh, in one of the campaigns. So, yeah, it is uh, don't think that I'll be rushing any of these pieces. So I think I can let PVA glue do its magic. Um, and I haven't really thought about what 
all the players are gonna face in this kind of wasteland town or wasteland it's a port city actually um, but I know that like this all feels right for a city that's been kind of lost you know lost on the water type of thing or kind of sunken in to the water so probably all of this plus um, you know ravagers or you know Haven will have become something new Thanks, Chronix. Darkness, I've been trying to build an undead dungeon and have what should be a clear passageway, but have a living wall in its place. Oh, like a... That sounds interesting. Let's see here. It is just really nice not to be working on mimics right now. <laughs> I can I can tell that keeping the variety on the stream is going to be crucial for me. Not for you guys, but whatever for you guys, but for me definitely. No, well, that's a really good point. I think that there's, I think that there, um, there's a natural sort of tendency to like, oh wait, I wanna, I wanna get this all just right, you know? I gotta, I gotta, and I mean, even with these pieces, I look at these pieces, and you know what I see? Why was I not? Why was I ever doing something where I was like staging some of these foliage and not just gluing them? It's exactly the same tendency that you're talking about, Noel. Like. Uh, I, I don't I, it, yeah it's a I guess like it's like a, a general like self doubt or like maybe like a, a very very slight anxiety around what you're making and not wanting to screw it up um, I'm not sure that there's a way to fast track though that though I'm not sure that there's a way to get over that maybe to lessen it to a degree darkness Mimics, mimics are in the rearview mirror. What are you doing? No, I'm just kidding. We can talk about mimics still. I feel like I've got a lot more to talk about with mimics than ever before. Get in there. Gotta be some growth up around this statue. trying to think ahead too and like I might you know at a later stage of these guys be adding something like like moss you know um, so whatever I add here you know to the base of this guy uh, can just we'll just help sell that idea uh, Noel that's awesome I'm glad to hear that
too long. Uh, what's up, Goit? Thanks for checking out the stream. Beginner terrain. Well, like uh, like Noel mentioned, uh, uh, tiles, dungeon tiles, things like that are, are never a bad thing to have. Uh, I don't think there's a single uh, dungeon tile. Um, I never made like classic dungeon tiles, but I made like tavern tiles and stuff like that. I don't think that there's a single one of any of those that I've ever made that I'm not still using. You'll always find a way to keep using tiles. Um, you know, I like uh, my first craft was uh, uh, Black Magic Crafts Fountain, so I tend to speak highly of that. That's a su that's a super approachable thing, and I still use that. Never never remade it. Never felt the need to. It works just fine as is. Um, would be another one. I think anything with anything certainly that that involves like some you know cutting up some bricks maybe like a maybe like a wall like like ruined walls black magic crafts tutorial for that is also awesome. Um, I still have and use my my set of ruined walls. Um, also, and just to say this because I you know don't want to forget to say it, literally whatever gets you like excited. Don't be afraid to swing, you know, swing for the fences or whatever. Because the number one thing, like if you're inspired to make something or you've got a reason for it at the table, that that is always for me like the number one motivator. Like I want to, I want to see something like this on the table, or I want to enable this type of gameplay. Therefore, I'm going to make something. That's that's always been, or I should say, since I've kind of gotten into crafting, that is my my number one sort of driver. I should say. And so I'd kind of point the question back at you. Say, what are you? What are you? What are you inspired to make? You know, when you think about crafting terrain, what gets you excited? And maybe explore that a little bit. Because even if you do kind of a crappy job, like let's face it, no matter what you do, it's going to be kind of crappy compared to what you do eventually. Um, but that doesn't matter. I still use. I shouldn't say all of. I still use most of the crap terrain that I've made over the years um, because that's just what happens as you get more experience you're gonna go wow this is not as good as what I can do now and that's a really really good thing that means you're improving right and as long as you can be comfortable making crap you can't be stopped <laughs> that's that's the secret just gotta be able to look at that junk you make. Thanatos, uh, yeah, I typically I have a series of questions, you know, kind of get caught up with players, and then I'll ask, you know, what people remember, and you know, mostly because I'm curious. Like, it's a really useful tool to to ask players to do a recap before you offer a recap. I typically fill in the blanks, especially if it's stuff that. Anything that the characters would definitely be aware of, I make sure that the players know, because uh, otherwise it's hard for them to to role play, right? But it's a really useful tool to stop and go, okay, what do you guys recall? Because that'll tell you what actually stood out in a session, what they actually remember, and that could be a helpful way to kind of gauge that going forward. Uh, Noel, absolutely. 
Darkness, my favorite class to play. Uh, I've only played two classes myself. Um, you know, in a sense, I guess my favorite is, uh, you know, NPCs, because that's what I play the most. I play bad guys, I play monsters. Uh, but in terms of player class, I've only really played the fighter and the wizard. First class ever, and, you know, sort of the classic spellcaster. That's all that I can really speak to, but between those two, definitely the wizard. I, I enjoy playing a wizard. G Grug is that? Are those the uh, are those the frog the the grungs? Is that what you're referencing, or am I I might be missing a reference, or I might not I might just not know what you mean. Like a good build, like best, like a, a class for it. I mean, uh, I think I think pretty much anything is justifiable. I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty liberal with, you know, assigning, uh, a, or I should say justifying. Like obviously, like a druid or a ranger, maybe. But I think it'd be really interesting to have, you know, uh, a barbarian grung or. Uh, a wizard or a sorcerer. Um, I had a giant frog sorcerer NPC that I introduced in one of my games that was unfortunately taken out like the very next session. <laughs> I think he was uh, taken for an experimentation by mind flayers, so he did not have a very exciting life in the game, but I thought he was really cool. Actually, it was a she. She was really cool. I don't remember her name though. I'll have to look that up because I haven't used her in a game. I have a tendency to do that with uh, minis and stuff. I, I once they become a character, I, I don't reuse them for a while, which is kind of kind of funny for you know a an, a very recognizable miniature. I, I don't reuse it again. I think uh, I think right now, if I were to if I were to to make a grung, I might be drawn towards a druid. Maybe that could be fun. Um, there's a uh, if any if anyone's a, a fan of Studio Ghibli animation, uh, I was introduced to that by my wife. And there is a uh, particular uh, movie called My Neighbor Totoro, and there is a cat bus. It's a giant cat that's a bus. And, um, you know, the, the story is sort of a fantasy, you know, kind of a children's story, almost. And so it's not like there's a bunch of deep lore, right, <laughs> behind all of the stuff. But in one of the uh, kind of behind-the-scenes art books on on Studio Ghibli, you know, when asked kind of the origin of this cat that is a bus, um, the story was that uh, well, the cat is a it was a cat, and this particular cat had the ability to transform into things, just whatever it willed. It was just a being that could transform. And then one day it saw a bus, and it 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 wanted to drive people around, and then it just never wanted to transform again. <laughs> I've always really liked uh, I've always really liked that. That's always stuck out. It'd be fun to play to play a druid in that spirit, sort of you know this unexplained uh, transformation ability, like like in a grung or something like that, and you know 
maybe the maybe the the wild shaping isn't always strategic. It's just what the druid wants to be. Why 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 explain any further than that? I think I've got a small one of those, but I think over here. Yes, Ashley, indeed. Just briefly, ever so briefly, touching on Totoro. Specifically talking about the cat bus and using the cat bus as inspiration for a druid character. Because the cat bus, of course, just wanted to be a bus. And that's why, that's why it was a cat bus. It's like it's it's meant to, it's meant to be. Come on now, get in there. Noel, how often do you find yourself reusing terrain? Don't want to reuse the stuff from that tavern because it's from that tavern. Uh, yeah, that uh, that happens uh, for sure. Um, although I think, like in that specific example, you know, taverns are I think people are pretty forgiving um, because it's you know how different can two taverns be? However. What I would say with terrain is that there is uh, an amazing, if uh, you know, as long as you're not creating something that's super, super bespoke, um, super recognizable, and I would argue like you know something that's like iconic almost to the campaign. Just cut this damn thing down. I think you might be surprised, and I can, I, I should probably. That'd be an interesting video topic, right? A really short video just kind of going over like the reusability of terrain because if I take a piece of terrain and, and as soon as you start combining it with other pieces um, you can see how many different things it can be Come on now. this was fitting I know it was I promise you it was um, so I think it's I think it's all pretty reusable I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be too I wouldn't be too worried about it. And even the tavern stuff, you know. There can be clever ways of sort of re-spinning a description for a tavern and, and combining it with unexpected terrain to end up with something memorable that's not like the other ones. Thanatos, do you have any tips on creating Lovecraft-esque settings? So I haven't done I haven't done a fully Lovecraft setting, but I've certainly pulled in Lovecraftian elements. Probably my favorite thing that I've done. So I don't know about setting, right? Setting and, and tone. Um, I think about Lovecraftian from like a like a, a horror sort of um, vibe. So setting independent because I'll pull this into any of my games almost at any time if it's relevant if that's the monster that's that's attacking. I think one of my favorite sort of Lovecraftian moments that I've crafted was in uh, Haven in a town that ended up being lost to this giant monster. Uh, the players it was a two player campaign and they were investigating. A political cult. They were sort of finding all of the members involved in um, sort of the the horrible things that were going on in Haven, and they found themselves at a uh, at like a what would be the word for it? 
basically a, a, a discreet meeting uh, that was held in the city, like on the water. And they were, you know, doing everything they could to blend in, uh, even at one point drinking what all of these like political, maybe like cult members were drinking, playing along with it, right? Learned a bunch of information about this cult and what they were after, walked out, you know, made it out of there, no problem. Went back out on the street, they looked out over the water and they were able to see like a new island and tentacles coming out as tall as buildings that what this cult was drinking was basically revealing to them what the entire city wasn't seeing, right? That was sort of a, a Lovecraftian horror element is that their eyes were sort of opened and they saw in that moment what the true threat of the campaign was, what the cult was setting out to do. Um, just kind of this kind of growing, just sort of gestating, waiting, otherworldly being out in the water. Um, which is a fun way to reveal the big bad of a campaign, I think. Uh, so that 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 kind of like unfolding uh, reveal, um, definitely thinking about like what kind of visuals to describe, you know, is is key for that. I think, but. What do you think? I think that's a pretty good piece. I don't know that I need to add anything more to that. I think that seems pretty on balance with the other things that are finished. <laughs> Budley Swamp Trimming. Technically everything that I ever craft for this channel is a mimic. Uh, you all might forget that this is just a mimic crafting YouTube channel. That's what I do here. And ultimately everything is that. LT painting or sculpting, uh, assembling right now. These are sculpted from, uh, these are an old project I didn't finish, so we are placing foliage across a bunch of these pieces to get them to the place that uh, they need to be to finalize them. So here, let me set that guy over there to dry. Uh, Goit, what what do I do if I want to make a, a live village feel chaotic good? I um, I'm not very good at alignment stuff. What do you mean by chaotic good? What does that feel like to you? That's what I would ask back. What's up, ladies room? Thanks for checking out the stream again. Good to see you. Working on swamp terrain. Any of this is peeling away in a dramatic, in a dramatic way that I can shove some glue in. Probably have to do it a few times to have any sort of effect, but you know, it feels like doing something. It's not like I want to do any major surgery on these pieces. I just want to, <laughs> you want, I want to move them forward. Big stalk, big, big bush. Little, little sprigs. Thanatos, that's a cool idea. Definitely, that that feels that feels uh, appropriate, appropriately uh, worrying, as any sort of Lovecraftian threat should be. some back here behind this boat. There's a nice crack forming that uh, can sort of hide the crimes a little bit. 
or at least justify them. Okay, good. Chaotic good. Like a place that uh, feels good and wholesome, but it comes off as chaotic uh, to the players or the surrounding. Chaotic. Hmm. I mean, you could you could you could mess a little bit with like with how they are how they operate. So maybe it's a it's a good wholesome place, uh, but it's basically on the whims of the uh, the barons uh, the barons two sons, who basically run one of them runs uh, the inn, and the other one runs basically like a network of farmers. And it's like, hey, this place is really great, but it's like, ooh man, it seems like rife for ripe for corruption, or like if the wrong person took over those things, that might be bad. Um, I don't know. Like I said, I'm not. Not great at <laughs> alignment stuff. Uh, Agrabah, sure, yeah. Um, you know, a place like that could could be uh, could be could be positive, but also, like I said, on the, on the whims of, of 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 young men who maybe are. Are selfish, or maybe they haven't decided to do anything un untoward to the town yet, but they could. I don't typically ask my players to to think about alignment because I actually don't think most people do think about it. I think people make decisions uh, not that way. And I, I don't want to muddy the waters by having conversations about alignment when we can just have conversations about the decisions that people make in the game. That's what I would prefer. Again, just, just how I run it. Not disparaging the use of alignment. Just That's why I haven't put much thought into it. some foliage growing out the back there. Makes sense. I think I'll put this down on this side actually. Try to cut this down a little bit so I don't have to make a giant hole stick it down into oops or just pull the whole thing off that's another option hey looks like you are the new winner anti-villain ideas. Um, one of my favorite, let me, let me make sure I get this right. An anti-hero 
would be somebody who does not want to be and begrudgingly accepts the role of a hero. Your Han Solos, your, you know, yeah. An anti-villain would be the same in reverse, right? So somebody who doesn't want to be, but begrudgingly accepts the role of the villain. So I had one of these um, in my... Uh, in my guild campaign where the players discovered eventually that their guild leader was a thousand year old lich in disguise before they discovered that there was a, a, a group led by a particularly um, menacing character uh, take no prisoners type who was attacking their guild they didn't know why and attacking them as well and when it came down to it to the reveal and everything it was because this character knew that the guild leader was a lich and was doing everything they could literally everything that they could to destroy you know it's like the anything we can do to defeat this 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 thing before they realize it is is worth doing so um, the ends justify the means basically became became a, a an anti-villain um, not because they wanted to do villainous things but because they thought it was all justified so I really liked that character it turns out that's because the same way that the players in my game had been tricked about this um, this guild this particular character had ages ago been tricked as well um, it was actually a druid character and it was a druid character played by my wife actually a secret a secret sixth member of that campaign uh, for a good part of a, a year, year and a half until that reveal happened and they learned it was a, another player the whole time. Which is fun if you can if you can make that happen in a game. Secret secret players are fun. Of course I put the glue in and then I'm like, where'd the hole go? Noel, maybe it's because I thin my paint too much, but I've noticed when you paint, your hands don't get nearly as covered with paint splatter as much as I do. Um, give it time, I'm sure. Uh, maybe, maybe it's a thinning paints thing. I don't know. Budley, this terrain is so interesting. I'm imagining a journeyman coffee ma coffin maker that got lost in the swamp. His boat merchandise is now sinking beneath, beneath the murk. Yeah, like the fun part about having terrain like scatter like this that can just kind of surround the place is that you know it, it could be like a mystery in the swamp it could be like you know tracking down and a story uh that's uncovered you know uh, there's lots of different ways to to do it but i love i love your thinking there <laughs> hadn't hadn't even considered that yet but i like it thanatos how long do your sessions last as long as they need to usually about four hours or less. Budley uh, is paying attention to the name of the show, which is that it's not about the crafting. It's about what we can do with it. Well, that's the, that's the rest of what the title means, but yes. That's the cool part, uh, and that's the really powerful part about you know, there's there's lots of ways to represent these ideas. I don't want it to sound like crafting stuff is the only way to do it because games can be awesome with or without. It's not the thing. Blah 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 blah. All the stuff it's, that you say, but it can be really cool to have terrain and be able to do some of these things and suggest some of these ideas. You know, just with the player's imagination. Sometimes with terrain. You know, players will suggest exactly like you just did, Budley, and then it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, let's let's go there. Let's 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 create that. You know, I hadn't even thought of that, but yes. Definitely. It's a useful back and forth, I'd say. Oh, yeah. 
buff when it fits in real tight because then I know that the glue can do its job. Wonderful. Budley, have you ever just ad-libbed a session because your players created an amazing idea that you just had to jump on? Um, definitely ad-libbed a bunch, right? Um, it's it's not my, it's not my preferred way. Also, <laughs> uh, I would say that I generally like to have something planned. Um, that's just kind of my style. I don't, I don't want to overplan necessarily, but I like to have key moments um, and things that I want to try. Um, but that's also because I don't really, I don't really ever like rerun something or reuse something. Like every session is, is usually the first time I've run that particular session, right? I don't really repeat stuff. Um, Usually when I do it, it's out of necessity because the players go a direction I never considered and I just have to roll with it, right? Which is fine. Sometimes it's more fun than others. <laughs> it just depends. Uh, Thanatos, probably. If it was part of their like character concept and it was something they were excited about, yeah. I, I, can, I can work with that. some foliage out of that. There's the coming out to just just spurts coming out of the back of the, the sunken boat there. Stick that guy back there. Got loose. 
loose in some places. Goit, uh, something like Thanos, or oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I can, I can see that. Um, yeah, I think, it, I think it all comes down to where you draw the line between, you know, you want a villain to sort of have good motivation and have a have a reason that they're doing it, uh, versus sort of the begrudging villain that's like, ah, if there was another way, I would do it this way, but I think this is the only way to commit to this thing. Um, that becomes, and honestly, like, I'm not even sure that distinction is, like, super important, right? At that point, you're developing an interesting character. Call it what you will. Define it how you want. Um, you know, it's good ideas. Another step that I want to start doing here is to, since I am going to do resin at some point, just kind of hitting the inside of this guy. Uh, Path of the Yeti, hello there. What do you use for your bases to keep them from warping? So these, uh, a lot of these bases here are actually uh, like a plastic card material. Um, all of these have warped a little bit. Um, how do you keep things from warping? Sometimes, I mean, there's lots of different things I've tried. Uh, the best thing is to just to get something either that's that's thick enough foam or cardboard or um, oh, what's the really strong basing material that people use thick enough that it's not going to warp. Otherwise, you can try to like pre-coat things. You know, if you're using something that's on the thinner side, like a like a thin cardboard, you know, or a ready board or whatever. Not not ready board. Um, just like that kind of. Uh, Thin layer, like almost like you know, a couple couple layers of like cereal box. You can try to like coat it on both sides with um, Mod Podge or glue to try to like take out the warp before you start gluing things to it. But it's tough, man. <laughs> it's it's a tough. Yeah, uh, a lot of it is really situational. It really it really just kind of depends. But I know that the reason I used this plastic years ago when I originally made these was definitely thinking like, oh, okay, let's see if this maybe won't warp as much. And it's not super noticeable. And I think if there were pieces that were noticeable, I either must have fixed them or got rid of them because I don't see them here now that I'm doing this, so. Yeah. There is like a, feels like a whole science around convincing bases not to warp on us, right? But if you uh, if you know what you're working with, I can try to give some more specific examples. Um, it's been a while since I've glued anything down onto something. No problem, Path of the Eddy. Thanks for checking out the stream. This is like a... Oh, hey, look at you. So I must have, this must have been stripped. I kind of, I kind of like it though. Ooh, maybe like right here in the middle. Kind of like that. Just kind of this like dead, empty tree standing in between these two, these two little ponds. 
a nice idea. And honestly, makes me more interested in maybe I do need to pick apart some of these. God, it's so annoying though. I don't even know how I would have done this. Uh, Path of the 80. Love your content. I'm actually about to start a DNA game right now, but wanted to pop it and say hi, keep up the positive vibes. Uh, thank you so much and good luck with your game. I hear you have really good taste, though, so it'll probably be awesome. Right? You'll be good. Positive vibes all around. Climbable trees. It's where it's at. The the one the one the one true the one truism between all of our all of our fantasy worlds or you know techno techno noir worlds or whatever games we run players want to climb trees that's the that's the one thing we know for sure i think uh last time i checked that that uh, on youtube that that trees short is uh is well over a million views at this point that was that was pretty unexpected <laughs> I didn't think that would be the video to do it, but uh, not complaining, that's for sure. But it was definitely a fun surprise. Patrick, my character is going to spider climb slipper on those trees. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, Budley, uh, sometimes. But I have to. I have to turn that brain off because I, I only have so many bits bins, and I can't. I can't fill everything. Thanks, Noel. Trees cannot stand up to spider climb slippers. It's just they they they, they yield they yield to the greatness. <laughs> That's gonna look like that barrel is wearing a hat. And I am here for it.
Uh, Thanatos, yeah, that could work. Um, you know, I think uh, I think early in a campaign, right? If the players do stumble upon the villain, the easy out from a narrative perspective is that the uh, the heroes aren't worth their time. You know. When I ran my um, guild game, and they, you know, they had a they had a guild leader that was a lich, I wanted the characters to be able to piece together that the guild leader was a lich, basically at any time. That seemed really fun and exciting. Uh, so, for instance, like one of the ways <clears throat> very early on in the campaign, the players discovered a journal from previous adventurers of the guild, and um, part of this journal was that part of the premise of this journal was that pages were missing and they seemed to have been scattered around the world. And so the players had a, a very bespoke spell called Locate Pages. So I decided when they got this that if they did that, you know, that this this lich was the one who killed that those um, previous adventurers. If they ever cast that spell within X number of feet of him, his pocket would light up. He would have one of these forgotten, lost pages of this old wizard's journal. And I, yeah, Daredevil is right. And I had made the decision. Again, just sort of committing to the, the, the premise that if the players ever figured it out and, let's say, carelessly, stupidly confronted him, uh, I had written down that what he would do is lash out in anger at whoever confronted him and basically power word killed him. And then, then he would then he would vanish. So that member of the party would be gone, uh, and then he would run. Um, the running wouldn't be because he was afraid of the characters, but because his whole sh his whole thing was being hidden, staying hidden. Uh, but his rage wouldn't allow him to, you know, to allow someone with evidence actually like confront him and and do that. He would uh, he would he would lash out emotionally first. And of course, I'm hoping, gosh, I hope they never, <laughs> I hope they don't do this. Um, it got it got really close a couple of times. It got really, really close. But it did not, it did not go that route. They discovered it and were very clever about it when they did uncover the truth. And the toughest part about all of that is to, I think, you you want, if one of the players is, is killed, or even almost killed, let's say, by the bad guy, you just want it to be satisfying. So I figured that even as disappointed as one of my players would be to say, hey, you're not who you're saying you are. In fact, we think you had something to do with, how, how, how old are you? You know, start to kind of go down that road. Because at the time, this lich had built uh, a life for himself, a thousand, a thousand years of being hidden, basically. I looked at that situation, if it were to happen, and say, if that player who accuses them is struck dead, that's going to be a really memorable thing, a really memorable D&D &D thing that they experience that they probably will never forget. And, I mean, undoubtedly become... Like that, that'll make the, the villain uh, for the rest of the party, certainly, right? They need to avenge their friend's, their friend's death, but um, the 
definitely not not a situation to take lightly once you're toying around with that. Unless you enjoy knocking off your player's characters, in which case, have at it. Fire at will, as they say. I don't know about that. It's only been... Well, it doesn't really count when it happens to pretty much the whole party and everybody's saved. You don't really count that. I don't think the whole party would count that as one. I mean, really once. That would be a miracle. Crazier things have happened, right? Anything's possible. If if uh, if Caden makes it to the epilogue, then that epilogue is going to be the shortest of all of them because it's him tripping and falling down a well. If only we knew that the whole campaign it was an epilogue that he uh, needed to be most afraid of.
Uh, I am drinking Old Crown. Black. Black coffee beans. Very exciting. It's the end of the pot, actually. It's very sad. goal is to keep it flexible using the, the PVA glue but to try to get things so they're kind of physically stuck in place so they're not gonna fly away. That feels pretty good. That's a good piece. Punky Llama. Welcome to the chat. Thanks for checking out the stream. What kind of campaign are you gonna use this for? Uh, swamp Terrain. So anytime the players end up trudging through a swamp, uh, never-ending story style, or um, like a wasteland or like a sunken city, definitely would be, or even just like a, you know, a sullen, uh, a sullen sea or, or a lake near like a witch's cottage. Like I think there's a lot of uses for terrain like this. It's one of the reasons I decided to make it years ago trying to finally finish it though uh noel ryan or anyone in chat do you consider yourself to be an artist or a writer i know doing this flexes those muscles but do you consider yourself one just thought of this painting terrain right now i thought i wish i knew more about color theory ah that's a good question I'm really just a party planner. I think I think that's I think that's me and my highest aspiration. No, I think um, I think there is writing involved. I think there is artistry involved. Um, you know, technically, it all falls under game design. Everybody running D and D is a game designer, right? Some some a little bit more, some a little bit less, just depending on how much of themselves they're putting into it and I don't think that you can design something without not like this not like a game like this without writing and without artistry so now that doesn't mean we're good at any of it <laughs> just to be clear that doesn't mean that we are that that is that's that's for the players to judge Uh, yeah, color theory would be would probably be helpful. Um, among 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 other talents, right? That would that would help. Although it is, it's. I mean, uh, one of the coolest things you can do in this hobby is learn something just to make your game better. That's like uh, that's that's like a, a DM flex. Craftsman, I like that. Yeah, let's pretend I said that. Thank you, Patrick. I agree. Craftsman's a good word.
Uh, I think so, Thanatos. Uh, but keep in mind, one of my big bads uh, is a god that effectively, to prove how strong he is, took away his powers so that one day he could he could he could regather them back and reconstitute himself as a god. So I'm probably just the type of person who would find that to be a fascinating <laughs> type of, of of big bad. It's a very a very relatable god, which is in some ways good and probably to some people in some sort of situations not uh, not as interesting, right? It just depends how relatable you want your gods to be. Hmm. This is good. This is good. I'm using these up so so aggressively that I'm I'm now now running out of good candidates. That means I'm not being stingy. This one has a, a tree trunk, so it doesn't probably need quite as much. There's a chest there. Definitely in here is a good spot. That's a great way to look at it. The best, and the best antidote to like, what if this thing I'm making doesn't look good is, uh, it's the two, it's the two or three foot rule. I forget which one it is, but anything that you're making, one of the worst things that people can do is make something and then share it online and take a picture of it or do whatever and then like look at the pictures. Um, everything that we're making is never going to be seen by a player closer than, let me get on camera correctly, like closer than like two or three feet away, right? Everything that we ever make for them is, is on the table, usually in the middle of the table uh, or wherever and there's a lot of, there's a lot of grace in that in that uh, presentation, right? Things are gonna look amazing to them because they're not looking up that close. <laughs> That's the best thing, you know? But a lot, of, a lot of tabletop stuff is shared online. A lot of things people make and craft and everything are online and so, you know, people, because of that, try to get really good at taking pictures and making things look good and in some cases even painting things that they don't need to for tabletop quality, they're making them for like to share, right? And I think that can skew our perception of what is good enough for the table or what is good enough for the table is even a negative way to put it. What's awesome already that we don't have to fret about. break my rule a little bit. It's not really a rule. It's a different type of glue. accelerant to uh, and super glue 
to try to get this to, to hold quickly. Will it work? Nobody knows. I don't even know if there's enough material down there for it to, to hold to. Hey, look at that, it worked. Great. Super glue to the rescue. Brand new super glue. First job out of the package. Good job, super glue. don't have stems for whatever reason yes in that case I use uh, not all the time but yeah yep yeah it's a it's called a insta set from Bob Smith Industries there's maybe now they'll send me a case of it Especially for basing stuff, I I can't be bothered to uh, wait for wait for basing super glue stuff to set. sense anything that uh, takes away wait time that's why when I'm painting minis I'm always painting like seven minis because if I if I stand still and I don't keep painting uh, I'll probably just fall asleep here three exactly got this guy tiny little pieces this guy yeah glue gun's awesome I should probably I mean mine's looking at me right there that would probably help with a lot of this but I do I do like um, 
when it when it when it holds i do like a, a really the, the completeness especially if i'm leaning towards a, a resin pour um i always like when i've got white glue there sometimes i trick myself with hot glue and i'm like oh yeah i, I, I got everything there and really it's just holding really well and i i missed a bunch but i could i could probably be making use of my hot glue gun here at the same time probably should. In 15 minutes I'm sure I'll be regretting not powering it up. Alright. Pretty mundane, pretty straightforward. Couple of couple of chests here. What do I have that can so ooh, big guy. I like a big guy. Yeah. I like like this here. Just trim down this trunk a little bit. I'm not sure that that really did much at all, but. It's gotta be, right? Ludley? What else could it be? It's things like a tree. This thing's ridiculous. It's huge. Sometimes they just. plastic flies all over the place. What are you gonna do? No, you're fine, Budley. You're just, you're only doing what players will do when they've been trained to suspect mimics, right? too. Definitely. I think I'll I think I'll cheap out and use my uh, accelerator again. Oops, not that one. That's the that's the glue part. I want the accelerator part. Super was really nice for that 15 minutes before I inevitably introduce this bottle to the accelerant and it begins to congeal <laughs> over time. You know, first first session or two with super glue was always like, oh, this is great. And then, oh no, what did I do? That's right. That's what you say.
If there's anybody that you should just trust implicitly every time, all the time, it's your dungeon master. Hey, I always say it's not me, it's the world, man. Be mad at this wizard, don't be mad at me. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm on the player's side. I, I'm, I agree that this whole thing is ridiculous. This is terrible. Well, hey, at least you aren't my friend who accidentally superglued his eye. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, it, yes, we were all lucky not to. <laughs> yes, that sounds awful. I will be. I will be happy forever that I am not your friend. <laughs> your friend who did that to themselves. That would be gross. The, the the closest I have to that is like scary like blade uh, accidents when when you know crafting and stuff. And th those are those are rare. <laughs> what you, you mean? You mean I'm not convinced? Oh come on. Um, Yeah, there there is a there is a tinge of, of, of trolling players in that, I suppose. Good. Hey, like it it, it goes both ways. There was uh, one time it was my um, gosh, what even was it? I don't remember which finger it was, but I I sliced it pretty good when I was working on a. Uh, a miniature. I was trying to shave something down and slice myself pretty good, and Superboy was my friend there because held it together. Uh, did a did a little monkey patch my own skin with uh, super glue to uh, bandage it up and didn't need stitches. So sometimes super glue attack. Uh, sometimes super glue got your back. That's that's what I say to that. I, I I can't I can't be mad at my at my my dear friend, super glue. Let's just stick a bunch of these along the edge. I think. That's right. We've, we've never been at war with Eurasia. We've always been fans of superglue until we until until something goes wrong. I think we were never fans of superglue. And back and forth we go.
uh, what's up, uh, Denovian, Don, Deno, Deno, Denovian, Donovan, Denovian, welcome to the stream, thanks for jumping into the chat, saying hi, gonna have to be real careful painting around that, um, we'll see, uh, you know, it's swamp terrain, so there's a lot of leeway, I, I, I think with this project, I'm only thinking a step at a time. Maybe a lot of uh, spray priming and a lot of messy painting going on. My plan is is uh, definitely not to keep any of the any of the greenery as as is. It'll all be uh, something different in the end. It'll all be uh, some sort of faded, faded, decrepit mess. When this swamp terrain is done. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think I will. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, I mean, probably. I think that would make it really hard for their recruitment brochures, though. Well, you got you to think ahead when you're naming something like that. They, they still got to convince people to to pay them money and send their loved ones. You're like, hey, we noticed you guys, um, FDM, what, is, what does FDM stand for? You guys rebranded yourselves. That was a whole big, that, that was expensive. You guys had billboards and everything. Ah, it's not important. FDM is, it's a, just three letters. The, it's the owner's name. That's, that's all, the, fo the founder's names. Really, I thought it stood for, anyway, should we get, let's get the tour going. Welcome to FDM. Well, there you go. We're good to go. We can open this business. We can make it work. We have the talent. We have a name that can't lose. And we have plenty of other name ideas. that guy let's see what this one wants got a couple of rocks 
it's not too loose around the edges. Throw a little bit of glue in there. You know, just for good measure. Oh yeah, big old gap over here. I might have to use some some kind of filler on that at some point, but we'll start with some white glue. Tree guys. Nearly done with the foliage step. Alright. The last lone little piece that just has nothing at all going for it. It's just this boring little boring little base.
this glued in place. And then we can look at the next step. Do that big thing. Maybe some of these. Let's see if I can pin that down. It's like a little bush growing there, and maybe one here. Genovian, this will be just standard D&D &D scale. Um, I usually have minis on hand questions such as this, but um, for the most part, I think with terrain like this, this will be more kind of around like the grid, you know? Uh, so like if I set down like a dark green battle mat, let's say, and then these will be the scatter around that sort of sets the tone for the area, you know. That's kind of how I would probably use it. Yeah, 28, yep. It's probably flexible though. I've just, I never really game, I never really game at other sizes. Um, Unless it's like a gimmick, you know, players get shrunk or something like that. Then it is technically a different size, but not a different size that really matters all that much. Generally, the accelerant takes, you know, 10 or 15 seconds or so, whereas the uh, a typical super glue dry time would take longer. But I don't think I don't think I connected it here. Oh, there we go. Let me get it in there. Nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's, I think it's all pretty damn flexible. At the end of the day. Just sort of hitting it with some glue. See if that helps stabilize it as it dries. All right, fantastic, so all of that, all of this, I'll keep the big pieces and then I'll throw out the rest. Can't keep everything. Not actually very much of that little stuff to throw out anyway. Let's see, so all of these that I didn't use, I'll stick back into a bits box or a bag or something like that. And, you know, I'm sure I'll be glad I have it another time. But it's not going to find life in this project. Then. We come back to, yeah, what do we do with you? So this, these like things poking up, this is, in theory, this guy is ready for the next phase. So what's that phase gonna be? What do we do with it? Big 
Mod Podge. That's what we do. Well, I guess first we find our Mod Podge, and then we Mod Podge it. There it is. Larger brush for this one. Let's see what options I have. The nice part is like cheap, cheap larger craft brushes. At least in this line of crafting, are pretty much only good for stuff like this. The goal here is going to be really just to cover big stuff with the Mod Podge. Definitely the sculpt mold. Uh, in this case, I'll do the bark. Probably the the ship. I'm not going to worry about uh, this other stuff necessarily because I think I'd come in with a more specific primer for those before painting. But pretty much everything else should become satisfyingly black. The reason I'm shaking this is because there's black paint, craft paint in here with Mod Podge. If it's been sitting for a little bit, just giving it, ooh yeah, nice. Just giving it a little, little shake to uh, mix it up a little bit. Tends to get goopy. doesn't have to be perfect, it's really just to one of a handful of steps, so it doesn't have to do everything for us.
Uh, Punky, this is uh, Mod Podge mixed with black paint. It does generally kind of act as a primer. It also acts as sort of a, you know, protective layer of glue, but um, it's also uh, the, the Mod Podge helps the the black stick as well, so I think it typically does a good job priming, um, you know, first step towards getting everything black in this case is going to be a good goal as things are primed and, you know, base coated using black is going to be helpful. It's also really fun to see things all start to unify with black. It'll take something that looked like it was multiple things and all of a sudden it'll kind of look like one. It's it's probably one of the most satisfying parts of like kind of kit bashing and using different objects and combining them together is once you finally start to sort of fade those lines in between the things, it, it is super satisfying. I think with the sculpt mold too, I think the uh, the Mod Podge is likely to help with some of the flaking, you know? Strengthen the outermost parts a bit. That would be a nice bonus. Like I said, I've not done a bunch with sculpt mold but Definitely helps with foam, makes it harder, less prone to breaking. Some of this stuff, you know, uh, the bark, the sculpted mold, like in theory could paint okay, but I would say it's more my crafting comfort zone to say, well, I know you'll paint better once I get some Mod Podge on you and black to sort of begin to fill in the cracks, you know. I think I'll regret not using more of this big bark in places. I think it's gonna sell as like a hunk of like a really old tree that sort of died in the swamp and sort of decayed over time. Punky, do you make money from anything D&D related or craft related outside of YouTube? Um, I mean, uh, here and there, it's sort of a, you know, it's it's all still growing. Believe it or not, I really only started publishing stuff uh, back in February on YouTube and, and pretty much around the same time on like Instagram, TikTok, things like that. So really, my 
a lot of my plans in those regards are still still coming into being. I was things were pretty quiet for me actually on the YouTube front until December when YouTube basically handed me a channel. <laughs> they said, "Hey, look. Here's 20,000 subscribers." Um I think I think no joke. I think December I saw somewhere around 5 million views whereas the rest of the year maybe, you know, a, a couple of million. So and that's over like a lot of content and a lot of time. I've put out a couple of hours worth of shorts content on YouTube this last year. So that was a very pleasant surprise when things sort of started to, to really take off. So in 2024, uh, we will see. Anything's possible. But in terms of crafting and stuff like that, I've only ever I've only ever done I've only ever made what I wanted to make. I don't I don't uh, yeah. If that's if that was part of that question, that's there's part of an answer. Uh, Bunky, I'm, I'm not sure I completely follow you, but I agree with the sentiment. I think. I think I agree. I am slightly confused, but I agree. I 
think I wasn't very well helped in there. How about these other pieces? Oh. To the moon with you, Leaf. You meant nothing to me. definitely satisfying seeing these uh, bases start to turn start to turn black that's exciting to me The, uh, the trajectory of that leaf's life was to, some years ago, be haphazardly glued to this base. It's anthropomorphic cries of, wait, 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 that's not enough super glue. And then to sit and wait in a tub for years until finally being pulled out and on first review, being missed, and it thinks, ooh, maybe, maybe I get to be a part of this piece. And then I tested it specifically, and it failed the test, and then to the trash it goes. So, it, uh, it was not meant to be. It's a sad day, really, for that leaf. Punky, that'd be great. Or, at the very least, that would be interesting. <laughs> Finding out what... I mean, I personally, I think, like, whatever changes in society could allow for sort of that, like, second renaissance of... Or third or fourth, depending on how you count them, but more people doing art is a good is a very good thing. More people creating things, however that may happen. Some people get all grumpy about that. I think it's awesome. Goosey goosey too. I think they'll be okay though. You know, in retrospect, like technically I could have probably hit all of these 
bases with Mod Podge before attaching anything to them. But I think that's pretty minor anyway, since it's all going to have to be painted together anyway. It doesn't have to be, but it's definitely easier. That's okay. It's fun. It's kind of it's kind of fun to like mix these different types of objects together. You know, little plants and you know these trunks have like flocking on them. It's like I don't know. What should I just paint over them? Doesn't matter. Black, <laughs> black. Mod Podge going over it. Whatever it is, it's getting glued down and painted over. It's gonna be what it is. I will, but the, the shrubs won't take very well to this, so I'll come back in with a primer directly for the shrubs. That'll be a lot faster. Either a spray primer or my brush on primer that's not using this big brush. But yes, I'm going to ultimately be painting those as well. Too difficult to avoid them. A lot easier to just, you know, repaint. Everything in this swamp is going to be fairly muted anyway, so we'll get it all tied together. I think one of my favorite one shots that I ever wrote and ran was called Everybody Dies in the Swamp. <laughs> Hopefully I get the chance to release that one someday. making some room on the drying table. Let's see here. So not sure if any of the other stuff is uh, very dry yet, but we will see. Some of it, it's been a couple of hours. I think that some of this was here already, maybe. I think this will be okay. I don't think I will disturb it very much by painting it.
the Mod Podge is fairly thick, that's why I'm like constantly wetting. Like I'm, I'm watering it down probably a lot more than I would in normally paint, but I want the uh, Mod Podge and the paint to be able to run into all the little sculpta mold crevices. when everybody was mentioning that the uh, swamp gave them uh, Breath of the Wild like ruined city vibes. I don't think anybody mentioned Witcher vibes, which kind of gives me... I'm not even super familiar with that franchise, but I feel like for a swamp that's usually like the go-to thing to talk about. On my list, just have not gotten to it yet. Yeah, that's what the uh, it's like plastic hard material looks like that some of these are stuck to. That was my attempt back when I put these together to minimize warping, which I think kind of did. Uh, no. Nothing, nothing special about that stump. It's just a stump. That would have been uh, forward thinking though, wouldn't it? That would have been next level. Nah, these, these bases are all basically just big rocks. <laughs> big, big dumb, big dumb rocks. With some statues and coffin sticking out of them. But I will say that's nice to have in the collection as well. I like the really elegant, like, precise magnetic pieces, but there's also a part of me that just likes having these sort of things to, you know, hills and stuff to sort of decorate an, uh, an area with in big chunks. It's sort of interesting if you, if you, you know, on that topic, like, to think about sort of craft the crafting influences or like tabletop crafting influences i know right if there's not a magnet is it really a piece of ryan's terrain um black magic craft is really where i learned the basics or i learned the basics is, is underselling it's where i learned the fundamentals and by fundamentals the stuff that i really really appreciated learning from his channel uh was not to like measure things, but just to sort of use relative measurements. That was huge from him. Uh, Rin, hey, welcome to the chat. Thanks for checking out the stream. I want to try D&D, but I don't know anyone who would be interested. D&D is, for the most part, a very nice way to meet people. So that kind of goes hand in hand. If you got two problems. D&D and people who know D&D sometimes you can find those together uh, what I always recommend to people if they're looking for a game and they're not sure they don't know somebody who knows somebody who already runs a game or have a cousin or a big brother or whatever um, check with libraries uh, yeah Noel's beating me to it game shops um Local game shops are, are great. Libraries sometimes have games, and then you know I found one of my 
uh, groups uh, on my city's Facebook page, they, or my uh, Facebook group for D&D in my area. And uh, there are groups. And then, and then if all of that fails, then there are some services you can play remotely with people online. Um, I haven't used any of those, but I hear people talking about those, so that's always something to check out as well. I hear people saying a lot of good things about start playing dot games. I haven't tried it myself, but oh, Noel, that's lovely. What a great story. The couple of games together, right? Hey, good job. PVA glue setting real nice here. No, honestly, yeah. I mean, I I, I would agree that uh, local game stores are a huge resource for finding people playing. Now, I should come with a big caveat that uh, you never know who's going to be running the games there. You could get lucky, or you could have some some rough goes of it. Um, D and D is kind of like if you wanted to play golf. It's really cumbersome. You can't really learn on your own. You gotta find people, or you gotta, you know, you gotta get get into the know. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the people who could teach you how to play golf are kind of jerks. Um, so you gotta find cool people, but they do exist. They're out there. Uh, and if you want to be sure that you get cool people, then you can become the DM yourself and. Um, then you decide who's in your game and you make sure it's all cool people. It's the only surefire way. No problem, Rin. Painting up swamp, ter swamp terrain and, and, and talking about a D&D is our whole deal here. At least tonight. For for weeks and weeks it's been mimics, but uh, blissfully tonight it's swamp terrain. <laughs> blissfully tonight it's anything new. That was that was that was how I felt about all the damn mimics. I was ready to move on. Noel, do you remember which uh, one shot it was? Uh, Rin, swamps are cool with all the animals that you sometimes don't see right away in muddy water that is sometimes deep but you can never tell mmm yes the nature of the swamp is it you know who lurks in the swamp uh, hey Jasmine thanks for checking out the stream painting or I guess priming some sculpt -a mold swamp terrain right now. Busting out some old projects that I haven't finished and trying to get them finished.
box adventure for the first time, so maybe like uh, Fandolin or like escorting a wagon. Might have been escorting a wagon and dealing with goblins. I mean, it's, you know, early, early campaign stuff. It's probably goblins. Budley. Finish those floating islands? No, I have not yet. That's that's on the list. Uh, those floating islands need root systems and all sorts of texture painting. And yes, those those still need to be finished. They are not there, not by a long shot. Thanks, Jasmine. So right, let's see. What's my what's my shirt and multi hyphenate? Uh, we'll call it. We'll call you storyteller. Yeah, most of the five E stuff revolves around Fandolin in one way or another. It's really strange. The starter kit and the essentials kit both kind of touch Fandolin, but like, I don't know, 40 to 60 years apart. It's really kind of funky. No, I'm just teasing you, Budley. I appreciate the the call outs. I appreciate you. Uh, it's it's not a call out. It's a call back. Calling back to my videos. That's that's so nice. Glad that uh, people watch them and remember them. That's. Super, super, super cool. I should say though, even though those islands, I haven't finished them. I mean, I've used them a bunch. So nothing wrong with not yet finished terrain. It's still good stuff. Hey Jack, welcome to the stream. Thanks for checking it out in the chat. I'm new to D&D, &D, I was wondering what set I should get. If you have a suggestion, I would love to hear it. Oh, thanks, Rin. It's really exciting once it starts going black and we start to see it kind of start to unify a little bit. It's getting very exciting. Uh, yes, Storyteller, Storyteller Jasmine, yes I am. Um, this, uh, by the way, this is the, keep the, this is actually the fourth day streaming in a row. So I'm on a heck of a streak right now. Um, this is the ninth crafting stream that I've done. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna try to keep them, try to keep them going, make them a regular thing. Uh, starting to kind of nail down a schedule, rhinemldm.com. Uh, there's a schedule page. Um, we've been kind of working on a stream page and, and stuff like that, so. Yeah, check it out. So Jack, when you say uh, which set you should get, do you mean like um, like the box set, like the starter sets? Is that what you're talking about? Or are you thinking, is it more like minis and, and terrain or just wanna make sure I know what I'm aiming at? Happy to help. Probably do have an idea for you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. 
Snow Owl says, thanks again for a great stream, Ryan. I was able to finish painting the Underdark, Balthazar, Fey Guardian, and started on three minis that I crafted. Well, dang. So, so glad. Appreciate the support. As always, that's so nice of you. Now you just need to post those uh, creations. I'm curious to see them. I think all of this is holding well enough to uh, kind of, eh, not, not totally. If I'm very careful though, if I am uncharacteristically careful as I paint, with this Mod Podge, then it should be, should be okay. Oh, see you, Noel. Thanks again. Good luck with your uh, class tomorrow. around these pieces that are not totally perfectly cured. Mod Podge is basically PVA glue anyway. It's not like I'm going to disturb it or screw it up by putting more glue in here. I just need to make sure not to tussle anything too much. It's very convenient for me if everything dries together. Uh, yeah, Mod, Mod Podge is, it's really more about a, a, a hardened kind of glue protective layer over it. I usually use it on foam, and in this case over sculpt mold which maybe it'll help with some of the flaking that I've noticed can happen with sculpt mold uh, with just kind of the edges breaking off, so a little bit of glue to protect it, and then um, it does actually act as a generally decent primer. The, the only reason for the black paint is to get started on like a dark undercoat if I want everything to be black, which in this case I do, and also so that I can see all the places that I've put the Mod Podge. Otherwise, if, you know, Mod Podge is naturally clear and that would be tough, or white. Rin, uh, the US is freezing, yeah. Yes, cold, cold, cold. Uh, yeah, Jack. Um, so I I learned to play with the Essentials Kit. I've heard people generally seem to speak more highly of the Starter Kit. But the new Starter Kit... Stormwind Isle, I think. Uh, I picked up and, and, and took a read through. I wanted to make a... I still want to make a, a video about how I would run it just sort of an idea for a video that I had. Um, and it looks pretty good overall. Like there are some small tweaks and stuff that I make to it, that's why I wanted to make the video, but um, it looks like a fairly interesting starter adventure. So yeah, that, that, that might be what, I, what I'd recommend uh, since I've actually looked at the new starter kit. Now that would be, uh, Jack, for actually like running the game. I don't know if you're looking to, to join a game or want to run a game of your own. 
Um, you know, if you're looking to, to join a game as a new player, then, you know, probably don't need one of the sets. Probably just need to, you know, get some dice and find the DM and follow their instructions, I guess, for the game. It really just depends how you want to get started. Um, my first time playing D&D was definitely as a DM, so nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. I think one of the most interesting things to happen to D&D um, is all the new people joining joining the hobby and getting into it, including myself, that don't have this long shared history with the game. All of this knowledge about Faerun, the Forgotten Realms, all these things, and, and people are just bringing sort of their own their own experiences and culture and knowledge to the game and I, I just think that that's a that's an amazing thing it's gonna it's gonna make the uh, and it has already but it will inevitably make the game far more interesting that the hobby will only get better getting exposed to all these new ideas So many drying little pods or clumps or whatever the heck, whatever the heck you call these. Pretty much everything that I put on these um, swamp bases was some old terrain that I basically was never going to use again. So once I made all my trees, these, pretty sure these tree stumps, this and some other ones that are on the other, these other swamp, uh, swamp bases probably came from like a, you know, craft store, Michael's. Maybe they were aquarium pieces, I don't know, stuff like that. And so at one point I would use stuff like that to just sort of fill out my fill out my terrain. Um, and then they just sit around and collect once I replace them with stuff that I make. And in this case, I was like, well, anything that I haven't been using is going onto a swamp base. <laughs> See you, Ren. Thanks for hanging out. Hopefully catch you again sometime.
whose idea was to make such big pieces of terrain? What was I thinking? I can already tell, too, that I'm going to have to, uh... Probably going to have to build... I've done this before for some of my stuff. But I'll probably have to make some bespoke, um kind of shelves for these because they don't really stack and if I laid them all end to end they'd probably take up a lot of room just at the bottom of like a shelf or something so I'll probably need to figure out some way that they can kind of sit freely but allow for other things to be like stacked on top and around them. to dry. Let's see, I think three remain. Carefully, carefully drying. same time. It's like the one good thing about doing a bunch of terrain pieces is it's typically always something to work on while everything else dries. Just keep on assembly line style moving on through. secure yet. I mean, not really. It's not like anything bad can happen because these things shift around. This is like the definition of like terrain that can't be hurt. <laughs> like, you know, how, how much, how much is ever going to look out of place on a, on a, on swamp scatter terrain, right? It's like, hey, that doesn't look like the swamp. It's like, really? That looks like crap. That, that looks exactly like the swamp. Shows how much I know about all I know is that it should be a sad place to be and there should probably be a black dragon there that's that's all I know as long as those two things are true in my game that's a that's a good swamp. move pretty fast make some room over here piece has a bench just sticking straight up like it was tossed there uh, black or green uh, why not both right we'll need to start thinking about some swamp inhabitants some people that might call a swamp or wasteland home
types of things that could be going on if you ventured into the swamp or the wastelands, the sunken city. Might just be fodder for the next preparing to fail stream. See what kind of cool stuff we can dream up for a swamp. I mean, who knows? Maybe all of this will actually be complete by then. If I do another stream or two focused on swamp terrain, anything's possible. Lizard people from outer space. Definitely. Well, the, the thing is, the, the the lizard people came from outer space, and then and then they mutated to look like us. Um, but then, but then this whatever happened to the swamp actually mutated them back to their natural form. So, it, it, yes, it, it's a the, the lore is, goes deep and is very technical. But you know, they are lizard people, but really they they were the townsfolk, but. Yeah, they're back. They're back to being lizard people. It's very, it's very complicated. Um, I don't know why people don't want to play in my games. Ooh, I know what I might want to use. So, I, so the there's definitely a game that I can use the swamp terrain in, like literally next week probably even this week if i wanted to but but probably at this rate next week at some point i printed up some like hard suit looking guys like uh big daddies from bioshock be cool to see some of those guys traipsing through a swamp like this that would that would be that would be exciting i don't know what they would be doing that'd be the fun thing to figure out but that may be the mini that I want to, the mini, the set of minis that I want to paint after this swamp terrain is ready. Because that would just be cool to see them, you know, even in a fantasy setting, that's totally fine. Some like, you know, crazy metal suit contraptions and just the splish splash and the, the stomping of, you know, three or four of those going through the swamp would be super interesting it's like how can I justify this cool idea are they friendly are they not maybe it's more complicated than that definitely makes uh, visiting a swamp start to feel like visiting another planet which is great sometimes that's the the vibe that I feel like my game goes for, or a lot of fantasy kind of mishmash games go for, where you know when you travel over the hills, or you go up into the mountains, or you know you sail across the sea and you go to a new island. It's like it's kind of like it's kind of like old Star Trek. It's like what what crazy culture, you know, what weird situation are we going to be faced with here that almost seems to defy possibility, like. Yeah. I need to go back and watch some old Star Trek. I think I think that those ideas have influenced me more than I thought in how I run my games. And an excuse to watch old Star Trek is never a bad thing. Just need the time to watch it. <laughs> All right, first pass. First pass on that is good to go. So let's come back and revisit now. Big old duder here, number one. Take a look at uh, the Mod Podge on the sculpt -a mold is pretty much all dried, including the other materials. Um, this one for sure is, is solid, all the foliage and stuff is, so I can come in here with a more specific brush 
to, um, to, to prime some of the stuff. That may be what I try to do right now. That was smart, Ryan. That, that brush was holding together crucial little turn markers. Just any old crappy brush is typically what I what I use for priming stuff. Especially what's gonna be mixing with Mod Podges and glues and stuff like that. A lot of different ways to go about um, a lot of different ways to go about priming these little bits and bobs. I think my go-to is this uh, spray-on primer, or spray-on primer, brush-on primer. I think it's just favorite thing to work with. I don't have to take it out into the frigid cold. I don't have to wait a really long time. It basically goes on just like paint. Dries just as fast and I can get back to business. So what I'm what I'm now here to find out is it okay, how painful is this gonna be? How, how painful will it be to come through here? and prime some of these things. Because I definitely can't just paint straight on the plastic. Sort of a top side and an underside. Looks like in places where the plastic was hit with Mod Podge, it did sort of. And I mean, it's all it's all green anyway, so anything that shows through, especially like underneath or like in between on the leaves, like it's not it's not that big of a deal. But my goal is to considerably darken them, and that will look a little bit weird unless they uh, get a new brand new color that's what I think is best and these uh, kind of spikes these are like spears sticking up out of the, the swamp which is kind of cool cool storytelling element I guess the lizard men put them there probably sending some sort of a message like why are there six, not five or seven? There's got to be a reason for that. It's definitely not just how many of these little skewer, plastic skewer, skewer swords I had. It's definitely not that. There's some real deeper meaning. And yes, we have reached Ryan's crazed rambling portion of the night. This is what this is what everybody this is this is the uh, this is the true value add of a crafting stream is that normally I would just be thinking these things or mumbling these things to nobody as I go through the mundanity mundane tasks associated with making tabletop terrain sometimes. It's like nobody wants to listen to this nonsense. Like, ha ha. Six people do. <laughs> then you wait a beat. Uh, well, five people still do. Shit. Made a horrible mistake. And then some of this stuff, when it gets really low to the ground, it's just the completionist in me that 
well, I mean, really, once it gets really difficult and down there, and hey, that piece that's gone forever, no problem there. Um, getting in there too far is not really going to be necessary because they're not going to see it that close. It's the it's the two foot rule, right? And I'll just hit with primer any spots that the Mod Podge missed. It's definitely the vibes are a little bit painting the roses red. Just a little bit. Punky Sirenscape. I tried it once. Um, I don't think I stuck with it. I think that I uh, it, it didn't I don't think it really resonated with me and how I run games. I think because that's it. Just to make sure I'm thinking of the right thing. That's like sound effects and music and stuff like that. I think I I think I tried it and it, and it doesn't I, I didn't um I couldn't I couldn't find a way to, to balance it with everything else. Maybe I'm just not that good at multitasking, I don't know. Seems really cool though. Like I kind of I kind of wish I could or did. Maybe it's maybe in that sense it's still on my list of things to to work on, things to perfect or uh, improve on, I should say. Do you use it? Do you like it? my players um, and I have saved uh, for for each of them their sort of character song which is a fun way to encourage your players to think more about their characters Just say hey if your if your character had like a you know call it a theme song call it a, a you know song that plays when they do something awesome you know what would what would that song be it's always interesting to hear what what players answer that with. Sometimes it gives you a better picture of how they view themselves and their characters. Uh, you're wanting to develop a fully immersive play system like you mean to simulate all the senses to match the setting. Well, good luck to you. That is that is very ambitious. It's a cool thing to shoot for, definitely. Still some green in there, but I don't think it's gonna be a problem. All right. Give that a chance to dry. It can dry right here though, I think, because I think all the runny uh, mess of Mod Podge is, is, is good, is done. Yeah, this is this is I'm I'm glad this is the uh 
I'm glad this was the abandoned project that I decided to pick up and work on next on stream. This is very, very satisfying to begin to... I'm actually getting, uh, if you guys are familiar at all with Black Magic Craft, the current like black gray state of these is giving me some real idols of torment vibes which I've not played but see a lot of with the very clear branding and sort of terrain style that goes along with that I'm very curious I might have to pick up one pick up pick up a copy and see what uh, see what that game is like Ah, that that'd be a uh, that'd be that'd be that'd be neat here and there. I think that'd be hard to maintain, right? To to constantly be doing that. Maybe it's like a really immersive one shot or something like that. That that could definitely work. Fences here that are going to be probably a bunch of rusted out iron. You know, when I go stretches of time without painting terrain anyway, I forget how much more freeing it is to paint terrain sometimes than, than miniatures. It's like, oh yeah, there's almost like not a, a bad brush stroke I can do here. You know, everything, everything is just going to add to the final product. There's really nothing to really just kind of drop into a zone and put paint on things and it'll all be fine. In this case, I'm not even painting it, I'm just priming. Satisfying. Thank you, Jasmine. Have a uh, wonderful day. Uh, appreciate you stopping in. Good to hear from you. Have a great one. Hopefully catch you again sometime. I'm trying to stream just an absurd amount of time, so <laughs> should be should be some opportunities. these big leaves that I put everywhere. They're going to be so much easier than the big bushes. Just two sides, in and out. What's up, Matthew? Thanks for dropping in. Very weird to see. I mean, it's, it's, it's meant to be. Although, to be fair, I'm only priming. I haven't really started painting yet. Getting everything to a black and gray base is definitely a good start. The algorithm. Uh, we credit all things to the algorithm. 
binds us and protects us all. Praise be, we are not worthy. Speaking of which, I gave the algorithm a, a challenging one. I uploaded a nearly two hour video supercut of all my shorts that I published on YouTube over the last uh, calendar year. So it's like, here you go, YouTube figure out what to do with this. I don't really know. It's really long and it's content that already is, but it's another way to watch it. Who are you going to show this to? I don't know, but here you go. Now it exists. I'll let, I'll let, the, let the algorithm sort that one out. As annoying as they are, I really love these little leaves. I didn't necessarily even internalize the difference between them texture-wise, sitting next to these other big leaves. But I'm really glad that they are on here. They look super cool. The dark ground and the it looks like uh, these swamp bases are starting to look like Halloween Town. Ah, oh, Budley, thanks. As someone who found your channel only a few weeks ago, it's nice. Well, awesome. Okay, see, glad to hear it. <laughs> the artist, yeah, it's it's here now. That's uh, sounds like a. What do we do with it? Sounds like a problem for tomorrow, Ryan. I'm I'm today, Ryan. I don't I don't have time for these sorts of problems. I'm just making a thing. Well, cool, Budley. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad you're vibing on it. Glad that it's uh, laser targeted to exactly you so far which is great and hopefully others who uh drop in shorts aren't a super easy thing to to kind of binge through it is possible but it's not super easy to do that um on youtube so yeah yeah, I mean, I mean, could you settle for a, a, a dedicated one shot? You know, I think a one shot dedicated to, you know, whatever area could be cool. Maybe just on a whole campaign. I guess it depends. I, I shouldn't assume that when people say campaign, they mean campaign the way I run campaigns. They probably mean campaigns the more in more reasonable ways, you know. What, ten to thirty sessions is probably most people's campaigns. I don't know. I don't know how most people do it. All right, that piece. Yes, very. The current the current status of these these mounds is very 
very Halloween town, which is okay. I'm here for it. Um, I have no problem with that look. I knew because of some of the like 3D printed pieces and unpainted kind of scatter terrain pieces that were included, I knew I'd be coming back through with a brush on primer for these details anyway. So just do them along with the the undergrowth, the underbrush. Small one shot side quest. Like I agree with you, Matthew. Definitely, you want to you want to give them time to shine. Hey, Budley, I appreciate that. It all counts. And I'm just I'm and I'm honestly just uh, over the moon to have found so many people that uh, to connect with that like the. Stuff I make, videos, terrain, you know, an idea here or there, hopefully, that feels fresh. That's that's the goal. That's 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 what I'm trying to do. So nice to see it happening. Curious, do you guys find uh, do you guys find many um, D and D streamers uh, that you that you watch? I'm curious how common that is on uh, YouTube. If there's others that you guys would recommend, can't say that I watch a lot of streamers as much as I. I guess I am a at least a hobby streamer right now. I hear you there, Budley. It's hard to make time for. It's hard to make time for stuff. There's so many, so many to choose from once you get into podcasting. That's definitely true. How many painting channels? Gotcha. Yeah, Warhammer definitely dominates a lot. <laughs> There's definitely a lot, a lot, a lot of Warhammer out there. Makes sense. I mean, it's very popular. It's what people want to see. Ah, Punky Dimension 20, yeah. They make a good show. I've not caught much more than highlights, just because I don't take the time to watch actual plays. 
but it seems uh, pretty great. Definitely, they've got their they've got a they've got a style all their own. Is is what I gather. You guys ever uh, watch anything? I think I've I've seen it before described as like a campaign diary, not necessarily a, an actual play, but a sort of recap of a campaign, uh, usually from the DM's uh, point of view. You guys ever catch anything like that online, or or does that exist very often? I'm not I'm not very familiar with what's out there, or if that's common or not. Uh, Budley, yes, yeah, I, I do. I have a job job. And it's not at all really um, related to any of this. This is all different. I actually hadn't even gotten into crafting or anything like this ever in my life before D&D. So it's been a whole, whole new thing. <laughs> it's okay. You know, these things happen to the best of us, right? Got it, gotta eat. While a little bit tedious, I actually don't think that priming all these uh, bushes is that big of a deal. It's it's really only a couple of them that are time consuming at all. The others are super quick, so I think it's gonna be awesome. Man, I really love this like two toned, two toned like vibe. I have to revisit something like that. I've never made like Shadowfell terrain 
that's kind of that's kind of what it makes me think of um which which is which is Um, Budley, I know you've mentioned, uh, you said, I know you've mentioned Feywild campaigns and side shots before. Do you just paint over your other terrain to make them more bizarre? What's some go-to tricks for that? I don't generally paint over terrain. I have, I have, I have Feywild specific terrain, uh, which mostly, uh, is just my standard forest terrain with some strange, weird stuff thrown in. Uh... I think best bang for your buck uh, for Feywild terrain is just take a trip to your uh, aquarium uh, pet store or whatever, aquarium aisle, and just find the cheapest little like crazy colorful sprigs of plant life. Uh, just buy those off the shelf, stick them on the table, Feywild. Um, Punky, so much production must go into D20 and Dimension 20. You can tell they've got some really talented writers. The quality, Star Trek, I never on Sleeping Cities, honestly, Oscar worthy stuff. That's awesome. I, I yeah. Um, everything I hear about it's great. It's definitely like, I mean, everybody that these actual plays are like, so, if they're not peak sort of like mastery of the form then then man what's what's the future gonna hold ah matthew yes come over to the dark side you too can spend hours painting shields and uh, shirts and pants and little tiny swords you could be cool too what's that god have 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 miniature painters ever been done done worse than uh steve carell and the 40 year old virgin you guys seen that movie <laughs> that's like one of the examples that's what he does he paints little he does doesn't he i think he does like reenactment tiles that, so it's more like army men or like civil war you know tables or whatever but you know, he's painting, he's like, I will make your pants blue. <laughs> it's like, oh, come on. Come on. Uh, guys, you don't have to, you don't have to aim that laser focused comedy directly at miniature people. Who, who are we hurting? Come on, guys. It's, isn't that a bit much? Uh, Budley, of course, you have Faye Wild specific training. Well, yeah, come on now. I actually don't. I, I wouldn't say I have anything for Shadowfell though. So that's that's where my mind went to like, ooh, um, that would be that would be fun. I could I could I could definitely brainstorm some cool Shadowfell. That that would probably just be my my take or my imitation of the Idols of Torment terrain. Because when I see when I see that that stuff uh, from Black Magic Craft, that's I just think. Oh, that's that's my shadow fell. That's what, you know, or hell. That's probably what my hell looks like. Ah, uh, that does take courage. That's that's not nothing. something that I always have to pause before painting on minis is always eyes and I don't even really paint them like I put white for the eyes and then I use like a, a, a little um, you know a, a pen like a micron pen and try to go in and all I'm trying to do is just just dot them it's like it's like come on this will work this time and, and, and not make them and not make this poor miniature that I'm painting look all googly eyed after all this work went in painting them halfway decently and then they their eyes point two different directions it's like damn it 
just wasted just wasted an hour the number of times that I've just sat here going well that won't work repainted the eyes waited for it to dry tried again tried again Yeah, I, that, yeah. Never there is always an option. You, you, you control the world, right? Yeah, eyes are, eyes are tricky. They can send a mini in two very different directions. <laughs> Just like the eyes are pointing in two very different directions. Luckily, when doing some monsters with crazy eyes, like you know, mimics that I've been doing lately, it doesn't really matter if those go off in every direction. That that still that still tracks. That still uh, even though they can't track anything, that still tracks in the world. That still fits. for nine well hey first try who, who even keeps track of that stat that's that's not that's not even that's not even a beneficial you can just just wipe that off the board you don't you don't you don't need to keep track of that number I think what we're getting at is that a lot more miniatures should come out of the box uh, with at least one eye patch. <laughs> at least, I'm just saying, at least one eye patch, um, because then, worst case scenario, we're only making one eye, and it doesn't really matter which direction it's pointing, right? Best case scenario, maybe we can convince these uh, miniature manufacturers to start doing two eye patches. Because imagine then, um, you know, pro problem solved. Um, and I and I can't think of I can't think of any other problems that creates. <laughs> um, Every, um, I know people are really excited about new additions, you know, new TTRPGs, new addition to D&D. Uh, every class is a pirate now. Every, every, cl every class is a variant pirate. <laughs> no, 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 I, I wanted to be uh, Tabaxi. Mm -hmm. Yep, nope, those are variant pirates too. Uh, can I, can I still be like a centaur? Yep, yep, that's a, that's a pirate variant. There, it's a very it's a very flexible new class wouldn't it be easier just to learn how to paint eyes we have 16 new pirate subclasses for you to choose from <laughs> I do have um, so when I when I you know print or purchase minis that I know I want to paint, my organizational method for keeping those until I'm ready to paint them, and to, assuming I ever will paint them, is to put them into labeled baggies. And I definitely have uh, a bag or two of pirates <laughs> just waiting for me. Uh, I'll finish my big ship, and then fill it with pirates <laughs> it's, it's it's the it's the it's the silly portion of the stream 
hit my stride painting all these tiny little leaves and who knows what I'm going to say. I mean, the big bad could be a lich with a peg leg, or apparently, based on the world that I'm creating for everybody to play their TTRPGs in, the big bad is just... just doesn't have any eye patches. It's just... The big bad is able to see when all the others cannot. That turns out to be all that they needed to take over. When the whole world is blind. You see that? How are we ever gonna face that? He's at level level twenty. Did you see that? He, you see him catch that baseball? <laughs> Guys, we're screwed. And then the answer would be no. Wait, how did you see that? Did you take off one of your eye patches? But all of your powers—they're held in place by that eye patch. We realize as we rush out uh, sixth edition that five the five point five edition was uh, there were some oversights. Um, we realize now that uh, the vast majority of, of, of classes uh, were not able to. Um, let me check my notes here. Uh, that's right. Yeah, they weren't able to see. Um, which we realize uh, worked uh, in opposition to many of your fantasy role-playing desires. Um, you know what? I blame the playtesters. That's that's real. That's really those are the one. Those are the people that should have caught this. You know. You know. I'm I'm mad at them for you. Yes, yeah, he wasn't bullied, but yeah. No blind spot at all. He's a very dangerous very dangerous individual. If I can get all of these to a state where they can then next be painted, that'll be that'll be a hell of an accomplishment, I think. Ooh, yeah, look at that. Look at that split break off. D and D Pirate Edition or We Boycott. What are you, what are they even doing at that company? If not making us the pirate game we all deserve.
and honestly on some of these plants uh, after my experimentation this week with uh, speed paints obviously I, I don't want to dump all the speed paints that I have into the uh, actual like kind of ground cover painting I'll do that probably normally but when it comes to all the plants like they're already gonna be you know uh, primed gray like they're they're ready for speed paint coverage that would be a fast way to make work of all the foliage find a color combination that works and just kind of douse them let the speed paint do its do its work because I may need to come back over it anyway with a uh, stuff to, to kind of bring the tone of any colors quite a bit. Yeah, I think for I think for painting the swamp terrain, it's going to be a matter of combining some different inspiration sources. I think whatever the swamp was called, a never-ending story, like that's burned into my brain forever. So I'll take a look at that. Can take a look at uh, maybe some swamp swamps from the The Witcher. Maybe Breath of the Wild, but I'm leaning now, I'm leaning towards more of a, I think, a darker swamp feel than that. What was the other one I was just thinking of? Oh, there was another one on the tip of my tongue. Oh, I know. Not not a not a swamp necessarily, but the statue graveyard from uh, Goldeneye. Maybe that's just because the statue is sunk in, but that that kind of vibe certainly. they're on there but they are annoying to paint Matthew have you tried adding sand to a base then going over it with a green contrast paint slash shader makes for some really realistic moss and forest and whatnot you know I don't think I have I use sand on bases mostly for um, 
you know, either dirt or like, you know, uh, dungeon stone or even like desert. I don't know that I've tried it that way with, with smart. That makes sense. I should give that a shot. Budley, the, uh, so I have multiple groups. One group just finished up in an old forest. Uh, they were hunting down a gold pooping rabbit. Because D&D is awesome. Uh, the other group is in a dungeon uh, about to fight an energy vampire. Um, but their biome would also be considered the forest. That's sort of the area where they're located, it's just they're not really in the thick of the biome at the moment, they're under the ground. But if my players in my one group, uh, after the downtime that they're taking on right now, decide to head to the, uh, the sunken city of Haven that was basically destroyed and swallowed up by a Lovecraftian monster, then they could probably end up seeing some of this kind of swamp swamp terrain. I think it would be pretty appropriate over there. That's why it came to mind, because if I got some of this put together in the next week, it would make for a helpful terrain for that upcoming session, which doesn't always happen, right? Sometimes, sometimes what I'm working on and what's going on in the game just don't line up, or I don't get it done in time usually, and that's okay. You don't need custom terrain, but if I can line it up, well, hey, I'm going to try to do that. It's my it's my world. I uh, I don't know how big it is yet though because it's an incomplete world. So basically, I add a region to my world every time I uh, run a campaign in it. I just kind of add on to the maps, build out the world as I go, and uh, you know each new region try to readdress the Pantheon, kind of fill out the region according to what's needed for the campaign. So hopefully there's some, you know, unique things about each area. And uh, yeah, when I started really my first uh, real campaign with a group, I knew that members of the group had a bunch of experience with Forgotten Realms that I didn't have. So even if I wasn't already interested in a custom world, I kind of had to do it because I didn't want them correcting me for years that like I didn't know a bunch of stuff. I didn't want to have to do like a bunch of studying to run, you know, in somebody else's world. It was like, hey, look, here's, it's real easy. It's my world. Now I say what goes. <laughs> so when on the one hand I've got do a bunch of research is my option, which, you know, I'm not opposed to research, but you know, do a bunch of research in order to run in somebody else's world where now I'm like, monkeying with an existing system or I just say it's mine and then yeah elves and dwarves can have kids why not because I say so right and then we're off to the races 
or whatever silly antiquated old-fashioned rule is hanging around in whatever world I don't want to use. That's why I make it my world. Yeah, really, it's just I don't want to, uh, you know, I, I, I assume that any world that I try to create is going to be shockingly smaller than it probably should be, you know? It's like, this world shouldn't have only 12 cities in it, Ryan. Um, so, you know, if, if my natural inclination is to create things that are the size of regions anyway, then I'll create a region with each campaign. And then at some point or another, I'll kind of zoom zoom out, pull back, and go, hey, look, this looks like it could be a world. And now I've got, you know, interesting stories that are spread throughout these different continents or whatever they end up becoming. <laughs> um, I mean, they could. Uh, or maybe it makes either an elf or a dwarf, right? It's like eye color. Oh yeah, pulling the wool over their eyes for sure. Absolutely. Man, whose idea was it to create so many pieces of swamp terrain? Me three years ago? <sighs> what a great idea, Past Ryan. I'm always, I'm always paying for your decisions, Past Ryan. But that's okay. Because I'm a, I'm a screw future Ryan. That's how I'll get that's how, that's how I'll get my revenge. The nice part about making a lot of terrain when you do sit down to make the terrain is that uh, you don't have to come back and make more of it at some point. You've got enough to fill a table with, or at least spread around generously on a table, so it's mostly okay. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh, I see. Who could have predicted this? Me. Definitely. these leaves are holding up pretty well seeing as how they were only glued less than three hours ago I wasn't even really thinking about being gentle as I painted them thanks extra strength Elmer's PVA glue you've saved my butt I always knew you would
Hey, thank you, Budley. Catch you next time, hopefully, or any other time. Thanks for subscribing and all the kind words. Take it easy. Hiding plants behind behind the boat almost got away from me at this time. Pieces. They get smaller and smaller and smaller.
stupidest, coolest little plants. These little shrubs. Just dumbest little things. majority of these things are done I've got after this one four more tiny little mounds none of them have as much stuff on as any of these feeling good finishing strong well not finishing but bringing them all to a similar point where they can be painted properly not just not just prepped for painting
table camera is gone. How could this be? Except that it died. What an unbelievable turn of events. This actually happened uh, twice this week. Well, la last time I noticed before it just up and died. Uh, so clearly, I need to figure out a way to keep that thing properly powered. Uh, where am I at? Over here. <laughs> because as it stands it's not getting enough juice to hold on camera won't stop me from getting this terrain to where it needs to be and where it needs to be is ready to be painted that uh, I paint longer and faster than any machine can keep up, right? It's not enough battery in my phone to even track my progress. What does that tell you? remaining look at all these look at all these big big leaves to paint it's like a it's like a dream Well, also prime these little crates that I had on the base too. Quickly give them a once over.
not not quite stuck in their position yet. Just do these big leaves up here. may need to be re-glued or check this idea out those leaves are gone forever <laughs> don't have to re-glue them if they don't exist just paint over that little section there another leaf casualty they were more trouble than they were worth stay attached to my base fine I will throw you away and never think of you again Seeing the candle method play out before your eyes. Yes. Just becomes more trouble than it's worth. Gets in the way. said sewer there for a second honestly these could also work just fine you know play sporadically in a sewer system I bet and that would be just fine as well this bench while I'm at it This guy. Uh, big leaves. 
definitely like big leaves. And these seem to be a bit more solidly in the ground. Painting them isn't pulling them out. You'd love to see it. Of course, stupid long spindly leaves. Ooh, okay, but I also have a Another old iron fence I can paint. That's a nice highlight. I actually really like priming these fences. Are they really? I think they're called like granny grating. That I just sort of cut into these like sh sh the shapes of fences. Works pretty well. Actually, See if I can succeed in bringing back. Hey, charged with a new life. It will bear witness to the final one and a half primed swamp mounds. Development that can only be seen as victory. It's actually it actually is a a pretty big accomplishment getting all of these to the point where they can, you know, pretty much just be painted next time. I mean, these were sitting in a tub this morning. meaningfully touched them or even really thought about them for my games in a really long time. Hey, thanks Path. They are... Well, it's just exciting knowing that I can, I'll be able to leave them all in a state where they can pretty much be, uh, be painted not always the case that that's where projects have to pause but and I can tell that there's also like you know here this one you can see a very clear split from the base that's happening but I can I can fill that um, those those you know little little tiny corrections here and there are no big deal all right let's move this further in Um, no, my players are actually headed, um, ah, last one, not headed to a swamp necessarily, but they're heading to a, um, basically a wasteland of a port town. So this stuff all fits as well. Um, it's flexible enough that a lost sunken city, uh, would absolutely probably bear a lot of these same same kind of beats uh, in the train so I can definitely I can definitely make use of these um, and even if not then like this terrain has been staring at me from the corner for far too long it 
I started it uh, ages ago, probably for something, actually no, definitively for something in my campaign, and I missed it, missed the uh, the window of time, you know, so, uh, actually, I don't know, no, 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 <laughs> I didn't miss the window of time. I created all of these, they weren't, they weren't done, but they were, you know, halfway done, or whatever percentage done, sitting on the shelf, and the players who the last session prior had said, yeah, we're going to go to the swamp. As they got closer to the swamp and they learned about the area and they learned that there was a dragon living in the swamp, never had a player group do this before, uh, they all went, yeah, let's go back to town and maybe choose a different thing to do because we don't want to face a dragon yet. <laughs> And I just kind of turn my head and look at all the terrain that's nearly done to handle both the swamp and their first real dragon encounter and say, okay, you guys turn around and head back to town. That's why none of this terrain got finished. It's really my player's fault. It was not me not keeping up with them. The, the the me fault was then it sat on my shelf for probably two years I haven't touched this which is pretty wild but believe it or not it is not the oldest terrain that I've not touched that I've not uh, that that I would have to dig around a little bit for but I definitely have some unfinished terrain that's older than this definitely you know what that particular group is is definitely unique in a lot of ways like i i actually really appreciate their approach and that they're willing to do stuff like that um i mean it's basically role playing right like some might call it metagaming but they're just going wait a minute our characters aren't looking to prove something and fight a dragon and you know, we like our characters. We don't want to lose our characters or whatever. Like, they're taking the threats of the world very seriously. Um, definitely, I don't mind it at all. What's more realistic than going a direction and then realizing you don't want to go that direction, stopping and turning around and going the other direction? <laughs> Feels very human to me. Very, very relatable. There. Ha. Ha. <sighs> okay. So that should put us in a pretty good spot to, for the most part, be painting and finishing, uh, which should be really fun and rewarding. Probably looking at two phases, looking at an initial ground cover paint job. Uh, and then honestly, for some of the, or for probably most of the foliage, because it's in a light gray state, I can probably very quickly knock out most of it with speed paints. And then there are other objects and other things and stuff. Um, but yeah, pretty good. And then of course, once it's all finish to that stage, a lot of these, probably all of these get some level of resin pour, which will be very exciting. So it's probably, probably two to three more crafting sessions, maybe two. I can't imagine more than three because they actually, they actually move pretty quick, but th these are going to be super, this is going to be super cool. Like looking around at all the variety of stuff, like I'm, I am, I am here for it. I am all about getting this terrain working. So I think it'll be a couple of days until the next one that I have scheduled, uh, next one of, of these particular streams, but uh, time will fly by because, because the swamp is waiting for us. <laughs> yes, something like that. And they will they will begin to look 
more and more natural and awesome and decrepit and terrible. Uh, and I can't wait. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for hanging out uh, and uh, chatting and, and everything uh, tonight. This was a lot to get done. Thank you, Pat. Um, I appreciate it. You have a good one, too. And we will be back to crafting here in a couple of days. Uh, hope everybody has a good one.